Hello Salem, this is William Legault of Salem Digest. We are here to uh, bother you in your own living room <laughs> one more time. Uh, today we have uh, what I think is going to be a pretty interesting guest for you. Uh, we have Erin Truex who is um, jack of all trades, master of some I'm going to say. Uh, she uh, works in the nonprofit field, is a uh, raising funds, raise funds on a volunteer basis for various uh, charitable organizations, is, uh, is a football player, full contact world champion football player. How many of those do we have living in Salem? Not too many. And uh, I got to know Erin because uh, she has, she's a, a regular character that appears at Notch to drink, uh, to drink fresh craft beer. So we're going to start off right away by saying hello, Erin. How you doing? Great. Thanks Welcome for Welcome to me. Salem Digest. Appreciate and that. we're going to jump right into it. So why don't you tell us a little something about yourself, where you're from, how you got to Salem, what you're doing here, and uh, what it is you're doing these days. Yeah, I, you gave a great intro. That's pretty much me in a nutshell. So we should just close it down we're now? We're done. We're done. We're all That's set. It. All right. All good, squared good. away. No, I, uh, I moved to Salem in 2016. So if I get on the Salem message bar boards, uh, people will often say that, you know, I'm a newbie. I can't have an opinion. I'm not part of old Salem. Uh, no, so. you got about five years to go before you're a newbie. Five more years before to a go newbie. before yeah. I can have an opinion. But yeah. I moved to Salem in 2016 on Halloween, closed on my house on Halloween, and just really fell in love with the city. So I am originally from California. Don't hold it against me. Uh, it's not uh, too late for that. <laughs> but grew up in a small little beach town called Oxnard and came out uh, East Coast to get my master's in social work uh, at Boston University and was living on the South Shore and found myself in Salem every single weekend. Where on the South Shore? In Quincy, right off oh, of Wall Street. Oh, right at the top of the South Shore. Mm -hmm. Right at the top well, of the South Shore. That's not so bad. You're close enough to the North Shore. Yeah. So how did you discover Salem? I heard about... Gula Gula Cafe and their 150 beer options. And so I just found myself coming up here every weekend to have a beer, hang out, work on work on trying to join the, the Flying Gula Beer Society. And that's kind of what I was doing on weekends. Was gulu just, Gulu. Mm -hmm. The mug is not a coincidence. The mug, yeah, it is yeah, not yeah, a coincidence. Not it, a it is fate. No, so I was coming up every weekend and I really loved it. Uh, knew I wasn't going to go back West Coast. I just really fell in love with New England. Uh, I moved here on a whim with two suitcases, just packed up, didn't know a soul, and relocated to the East Coast uh, in 2013 and then moved to Salem in 2016 and just never really see myself leaving. Is there a little bit of California in New England? Well, what drew you here? That, that's an interesting comment. Yeah, I, I love California. I can't afford California. <laughs> it ah. was, I was very excited to be able to buy a house uh, that had more than 300 square feet. But I, I just love the seasons. I know that sounds so silly because people like to talk about New England and complain about the weather. But as someone who grew up in an area where it was 60 degrees in the winter and 70 degrees in the summer, there was just no variation. And so to come here and there's fall and snow and the changing of the seasons and just so much of it is just something I never experienced growing up. And I was just really excited to to be here long term. Were you a beach bum out there at all? Did you were you close to beaches? Out uh, right on the beach, right on the beach. Ventura is a tiny little beach town. It's just uh, north of Malibu, south of Santa Barbara. Loved it, but I, I like the beaches here. I, I really can't complain. I've I've experienced both coasts. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of California, a little bit. There's no comparing Pacific, no, and Atlantic, no. Because Pacific, I mean, the term really applies. Pretty pretty peaceful, really really blue. Yeah, where the water here, while it can be very blue sometimes, is often kind of green. And yep. uh, the Atlantic is the angry ocean yeah. of the two, which really f explains the whole New England and Massachusetts uh, personality dynamic, I think. Definitely, definitely. And so much of California is centered around the ocean. So, I mean, I could tell you a handful of times where I'd go an entire year and I'd maybe gone to the beach three or four times living in California. It's just one of those things that it's there all the time so you don't take advantage of it. And I definitely feel like I take advantage of the beach culture a lot more out here. What's your beach in Salem? Which, which one? Uh, I love Winter Island. It's a good go-to. We just did the 
the dive to start the new year. The uh, Juniper the, uh, Beach. Juniper, beautiful yeah. beach. So we did the, the polar plunge. But I, I love Winter Island. I find myself there a fair amount. I like to go up to Gloucester, hit up Good Harbor. But There are bigger beaches, less mm -hmm. rocky Gloucester uh, up, up in that area. But the Salem Beach is kind of underrated. Yeah. Now, what do you call the beach at Winter Island? Uh, <laughs> which one? Oh, the, so I don't go to Waikiki. I do not go to Waikiki Beach. I go to the little rocky point over by the lighthouse so I can maintain social distance oh, nice. and no one bothers me. So oh, that's rocky. my little beach. We, little we like to call it Mermaid Beach, the, the lighthouse beach. I don't bother with Waikiki. I don't really like to interact with people if I'm at the beach. I just want to lay down, read a book, and I want to be left alone. A lot of locals <laughs> don't call it Waikiki Beach. What do they call they it? They call it Unemployment Beach. <laughs> because that's where you go in the summertime right. when, when you're on a, on a play. At least that's okay. what they did years ago. Okay. I'm, not, I, I'm not tied in with the beach crowd all that much. So okay. it's a little rocky point. So we've got you know, just quite a few beaches in Salem. So yeah. it's a bit of a surprise. What do you think of Little Juniper Beach? Had you been there before? No. never. I've, I've run over there, but I've never actually gone swimming, hung out there. But it's great. I love it. I, I, Salem's just a, it's a really cool landscape. There's just some really neat spots that I feel like, again, I've lived here four years now, going up on five years years and I'm constantly just discovering these little areas I've never seen before. Well forever now for as long as I live Juniper Beach will be known to me as the beach that ate my eyeglasses. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> so I feel so bad for you that well, was uh, no I couldn't feel anything though so I don't blame you if you had your sunglasses on your head and you dunked underwater and you lost them or your eyeglasses I'm not surprised that you lost them. I I had just put my beach towel on the top of the wall, mm -hmm. and I was getting ready to take my glasses off and put them on the towel, and somebody came over and talked to me, mm -hmm. and I went, and I started talking to them, and I forgot they were up yeah. there. And uh, we went back, we went to the videotape to verify that they were indeed. <laughs> Video warm. evidence. Yeah, and, and there, there, there they were sitting on top of my head. So, oh, uh, you know, no reason to feel bad about it, but uh, oh. it, uh, maybe uh, Mr. Limpet's down there, some fish yeah. might need him. So you've been in Salem now, you're going into your Fifth year, Fifth basically. Year. You live up there in the North Fields. I do. You like that neighborhood? I do. It's great. Over by Mac Park. Is that? What, did you live anywhere in Salem before you got there? Nope. How did you find that neighborhood? Oh, you're <laughs> on the Mac Park side. I'm on the Mac Park okay. side. How did I find that? I think it was honestly the only house I could afford at the time. Okay. Would you, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I just, I loved it. I love, uh, North Salem's a really neat spot. I love being able to walk around. You can walk to downtown. You can easily escape through Peabody and not have to go through downtown when it's chaotic during yep. Halloween. But uh, The old Tremont Street shortcut. Yep. Yeah, it's really fantastic, and I, I love it. I There's a dog park over there. Mac Park's really nice. I've been able to start running in that neighborhood. There's a lot of hills, but uh, truthfully, I didn't know anything about Salem. It was near the commuter rail. Uh, it was walking distance to downtown, and I just decided. And you found an affordable for you. Mm -hmm. when, okay, well, that, that's good. It's a great neighborhood. Love it. Uh, Mac Park right there, big yeah. park. Uh, yeah. Got the, the food the food fam farm there now. Yeah, it's great uh, to see what Maitland Mountain Farms has been doing. It's uh, gorgeous. Maitland Mountain Farms is fantastic. And yeah. you can get, I'm going to give a plug for Maitland Mountain Farms. They have a few food shares left now. By the time this airs, they may not. Mm -hmm. But you guys need to check out uh, Maitland Mountain Farm out there if you haven't already. Mm -hmm. So what is it that you do for work these days? So <laughs> I made the decision to pivot, which is, I feel like, the word of 2020. Pivot from what? pivot from one nonprofit to another uh, during the middle of a pandemic. So I am now the Director of Development and Communications for Mabel Center for Immigrant Justice. It is a nonprofit that was founded in October of 2020. So brand new organization that essentially provides pro bono legal services to asylum seeking women and children from Central America. So the whole purpose of this organization is to connect with women and children that are currently at the southern border. Uh, they may have also relocated to Massachusetts and are awaiting for their asylum case to be heard. And they don't have the documentation they need. They don't have the paperwork that they need. And so we go and provide legal services to help them ensure that their case is presented in a clear, concise way, and uh, they're able to receive asylum. And what is that exactly is it that you do for them? Director of Development and Communications. So development, essentially fundraising. So as a new organization, they obviously have a shoestring budget. It's a very small organization, but I've been in fundraising about 10 years now and was just, the, the story of the organization was unbelievable. And I was just excited to, to fundraise for them and really build out a fundraising strategy to, to make the work sustainable. 
I started doing uh, local, locally based fundraising for the Y back, mm -hmm. geez, 15 years ago, 16 years ago, maybe a couple of more. And I've still done some local f fundraising over the years mm -hmm. uh, through various, various methods and various ways. It seems that today it's a lot more difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, when I first started fundraising for the Y, they gave us the little story about the pie and its slices. Mm -hmm. Applies again still today, not as many slices, not as big. I am actually surprised at how many people are still donating to worthy causes in the area. So I joined the Mabel Center a few weeks ago at this point. And uh, in addition to the Mabel Center, I am on the board of Hawk, which is the local domestic violence shelter, and also on the board of Behind You, which is the organization that provides emergency stipends to out-of-work restaurant employees and service industry workers. and. To be honest, having worked for, for and with all of those organizations, people are passionate about the work that organizations are doing. And so if you're in someone's sweet spot and you are doing something that someone enjoys and that you know re really resonates with them, uh, people are still inclined to give. Obviously, the dollars are going to be a little bit smaller in some avenues, maybe institutional, foundational support. But when it comes to individuals, I mean, even last week with Behind You, we're getting people just donating their stimulus checks because they know they don't need it and they want that money to go to the service industry. Uh, so yes, it's difficult to fundraise. I think you have to get creative in how you're engaging folks, but people are still phil philanthropic and they're still inclined to give. Well, both of those organizations, Hawk and, and let me get this right, Mabel? Behind you. Oh, oh Mabel, Mabel is my full time it's and full -time. Hawk and behind you are my two but, board so, positions. But the Hawk and the Mabel um, are very out front and uh, they're, those are issues that a lot of people are concerned with, yeah. above all else. Right. Uh, immigration concerns yeah. and, and uh, abused women, children, mm -hmm. families. Uh, so it, that I can understand, that, that people are still active on that. Um, mm -hmm. But we had uh, the clothing drive last Christmas, 2019, mm -hmm. for Hawk yeah. at Notch. And I was, it's too bad we couldn't do that this year. Yeah. Just, 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 I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think anybody's even accepting clothing right now or they weren't. Uh, no, it's really difficult. You can you can make donations like unused diapers or packages that haven't been opened, but it's really a safety issue at this point, and it's just something that we've really had to move away from. But to to the point that you made, absolutely upfront issues, but you want to be so mindful of the population that you're serving. So I'd love to tell the story of Hawk, and I'd love to tell the story of Mabel Center, but it's almost more difficult because I can't go to a potential donor and say, here is this individual, let me tell you their story. That person is traumatized. They've experienced significant abuse, or they've just had a life experience that is unbelievable. And we really have to be protective of them and respectful of their story while still sharing to the general public why their story and why this work is valuable. Right. So it's it's an interesting uh, dynamic to, to navigate. So just uh, behind you organization, I know mm -hmm. a little something about that. Yeah. Uh, most people out there in Salem probably don't. Some may know a little bit about it. A few may know a lot. Uh, and this uh, current public health crisis here in Salem or on the North Shore, the behind you organization has become uh, very important and very yeah. upfront. Uh, what can you tell us about behind you? Yeah, so Behind You was actually founded as the Elizabeth Bocholtz Fund in 1999. Elizabeth was an uh, employee of the Witch's Brew who unfortunately fell ill and ended up passing away the night of the first fundraiser. So we know there often isn't a safety net for individuals that work in the service industry as it pertains to health, uh, in health issues or really financial security. And so the fund really operated on a small level for many years and then in 2018 when I joined the board and Dan Donato the board president who manages Octacog the marketing firm in town joined we were able to rebrand it as behind you and it became essentially a fund where people could apply for funding uh, if they found themselves out of work due to injury or illness in uh, in a l extended period of time so if you break your ankle and, and you're a bartender in town and you know you're not going to be able to go and be on your feet. You need some kind of support. That, that was unexpected. And so it was really important for us to be able to establish this fund so individuals felt like they had a safety net. As I, I remember Elizabeth. Uh, I had been back in Salem just a couple of years uh, when she did fall ill. I think she was on shift that mm -hmm. night and she went home early, which bartenders don't do that. Bartenders yeah. don't bang out of shifts. Uh, yeah. 
And uh, the intention of that fundraiser was to, to pay her rent yeah. and her utilities, I don't, maybe car insurance, I don't know if she had a car yeah. payment, I don't know if she had a car. And uh, I went to that fundraiser. I don't know if it started at 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock, it was at the Knights of Columbus. Okay. Uh, and when I walked in, there was nobody there to take my $20 or whatever. Mm. And everybody was in the main room, and it was just hushed. There were, people were whispering to each yeah. other, and I had to ask, what's going on? And they had yeah. just gotten a word about 10 minutes earlier that she'd passed, uh, just after they opened the doors. Oh, or wow. maybe before that, but they just found out after they opened the doors. So. Uh, it's, it's a poignant story, mm -hmm. and it's an important story that applies now uh, 21 years later, 22 years later. Yeah. Uh, it was started by friends of uh, Elizabeth, yeah. and, and then later on they also dedicated, we did that plunge. Mm -hmm. That plunge was uh, because Becky Christie, who started the initial Freeze Your Tush Off, which benefited <laughs> the, the Salem Pantry in memory of Elizabeth Buchholz, yeah. uh, when she did that for... 15 or 20 years, and then she decided not to do it a couple of years ago. And she posted on Facebook that she was going to jump in by herself this year. And I said, yeah. well, I'll jump with you. And then we ended up raising a couple of bucks. Yeah, we, we got great contributions, and it would, it's always nice. This, this community blows, blows my mind when it comes to how they step up. Uh, to support not only the service industry, but just really anything we do. So on the side, I, I bartend at Deacon Giles Distillery, and I know that when I was bartending there, every time we did a, a fundraiser where we wanted to donate our tips to a worthy cause, you know, people would come out of the woodwork to, to really step up and, and support us. And that's just, I, I see it a lot in this community, and it, it makes me happy to be here. It, it's amazing. Uh, when I worked at the Y, uh, the Y does the, there were, their own big fundraiser and push every year. Mm -hmm. And they ask staff to contribute. Now staff at the Y doesn't get paid a lot. Mm. The big wigs, they get paid very, very well. <laughs> but the staff, your lifeguards, uh, your fitness trainers, your yoga instructors, and even the ones that have the di title of director, they're not, they're not really all that well compensated compared to similar people mm -hmm. outside of the nonprofit world. Right. Same old story, right? right. Uh, but Salem, which is not the most affluent community in the North Shore YMCA orbit, mm -hmm. every year that I worked there, donated the, mo the staff donated more money by a large amount than Beverly, Ipswich, mm -hmm. Marblehead, Marblehead Swamps, I should say, mm -hmm. uh, Havel, or any of those. Very, very generous people. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's an interesting point uh, mm -hmm. that Salem's so quick to step up and, and put money in things. Why do you think that is? I think it's because Salem is, is, is more of a, I'm going to say a blue collar. Hmm. It's more of a, a, you know, we're a manufacturing town. Now, other towns around here had some manufacturing too, but Salem has always been more of a working man's town. Mm -hmm. We're not so much that anymore, but the roots are there. Yeah. And I think it's good. We're, we're more of a working man's town than, than any, just about any of the others. Uh, not that those are towns, other towns don't have they're, they're working men or working persons, working people, I should mm -hmm. say. I saw you rolling your eye. Uh, <laughs> men are the only ones that work in this town. <laughs> right. The rest of us just yeah. hang out. Yeah, well, that, I wasn't <laughs> going to say that. But I, I just think that it's, it's more of a blue-collar crowd, and, and I think that there's more of an understanding that there are people in need. Yeah. I, I couldn't, couldn't think of any other reason. Yeah. What do you think is the reason as an as a almost newbie? As an almost newbie. As you, yeah. I, I, I think similar to what you're saying, I obviously don't have a, a strong understanding of the history of Salem. I hear stories and I'm able to hear some personal anecdotes as it relates to, to this town. But I just, I definitely see, you know, I'm a millennial. <laughs> There's, I definitely see a increase in millennials coming into towns like this where they can commute into Boston if they need to, but they've found this community and they just want to ensure the community is growing and is reflective of the values they like to see. You know, that's why I, I work in Salem. That's why I serve on boards in Salem. I just, this is my community. I love it. And I'm really determined to do what I can to make it a better place. And I think that sentiment is shared across the board with a, with a lot of the residents here. Well, it, it's amazing that, uh, I mean, we're a city built by immigrants, without a doubt. Absolutely. I mean, going all the way back, we're a city built by immigrants. Uh, and my guests that I had in here last week, uh, Louise Michaud and Mike McGee. Uh, oh. Mike's been, Louise was born and raised here. She's a photographer. Mm -hmm. Mike just moved to Salem 10, 12 years ago when I said, 
when I asked him, Mike, what brought you to Salem 10 or 12 years ago? He said, a job over there at Shetland. And here it is, 2021, mm -hmm. and I had a gentleman sitting here, same old story from 50 yeah. years ago, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, 200 years ago, and further, Mike McGee came to Salem to work. Right. And he ended up falling in love with the city and meeting Louise, and, and now he's living here. So uh, we, are a, we are a city of immigrants. Yeah. And uh, we might want to do something about allowing all these people from California in here. We may want to yeah. regulate that. Yeah. I don't, I don't, but I don't, I don't know if we, I don't know if we, if we could <laughs> do that. So you got, you're doing all of this nonprofit work. What do you do for, uh, how, do, how do you relax? I take my rage out on the football field. You take your rage out <laughs> on the football field. Where do you take your rage out on the football field? So I play for the Boston Renegades. We are the defending Division One national champions in women's tackle football. We play in the Women's Football Alliance. And when I say defending, unfortunately, we lost the 2020 season due to this little pandemic going on that we're gearing up for 2021. But we won in 2018 and 2019. Uh, we play out of Revere just down the road from Salem and travel all over the country and just kick, I'm going to try really hard not to curse, but kick, kick some butt. You kick some ass. <laughs> that's a, is, I don't think that's cursing anymore. Okay, perfect. 30 years ago, he that was cursing. Ass. Yeah, 30 years ago, that was cursing. Yeah. You know, and times have changed. So I know the Boston Renegades have been around for a while. Yeah, so the team saw a lot of different iterations. They became the Renegades in 2015 when their ownership decided to not uh, continue the partnership with the team. So they were the Boston Militia, the New England Intensity, the just a variety of different names. But the Renegades in this iteration began in 2015, and I joined the team in 2016. I actually was playing flag football in a uh, recreational league and shattered my thumb. So I went to go pull a flag, flag football, that's how you, uh, you know, that's how you get someone stopped or out, whatever the t proper terminology is. You shattered is. your thumb pulling so the So I flag? went to grab their flag, the flags were positioned on their hips, they were running one direction, I was coming in, and I broke my thumb in three places. You get it wrapped up in there? I didn't think I injured it that badly, and it healed, and it healed crooked, so I have a wonderful cro crooked front thumb right now. And I love football, I really enjoyed it, and so I googled... I, I went on Google one day and I was like, I'm going to look up football and just see what I can do. Maybe I'll find something less dangerous than flag football. <laughs> <laughs> and I found full contact found <laughs> tackle football. And I joined the team two weeks before that season started. You know, I filled out an interest form I'm like, I'm 200 pounds and six feet tall. You got a spot for me? <laughs> like, yeah, I think we'll yeah, make well, it work. Might be able to do something with it. <laughs> so I joined the team uh, in 2016 you know, wore cleats that I had worn in high school, didn't really know what I was doing, slapped a helmet on, called it a day, and have played, I will be entering into my fifth season now, since technically we lost 2020, so our, our season runs typically April through July, we're looking at May through August, uh, due to the pandemic, just sho shoving it back about a month, um, but really looking forward to hitting the field again. Uh, I, 20 years ago, 21 years ago, I remember I, wanna, I worked at Roosevelt's, mm -hmm. the daughter of one of the partners, Anna. She ended up marrying a Salem guy. Uh, she's uh, involved down at the PCYC now. Her name was Russo at the time. I can't think of her married name. She tried out for whatever the team was okay. in like 1999. 1998. I don't know who it was. I don't know if she ever got on the team, but I remember okay. her being all worked up about trying out for this woman's tackle football yeah. team. And I just looked at her and said, tackle football? What are you, out of your mind? That's great. I love it. So you found that flag football was a little too rough for you, mm -hmm. so you decided to go with full contact tackle football. I did. I did. I just, they found random equipment for me, found some, you know, shoulder pads that worked, found an extra helmet, and just put me in a jersey and put me on the football field. Again, I there is nothing petite and minuscule about me, so I think they just saw a giant body. They're like, go on the offensive line. Don't let anyone hit the quarterback. You'll be fine. Well, they, they, <laughs> I talked to the co one of the coaches. You guys had an event over at Notch. We did. We did. We had a ring ago. ceremony when we got our championship right, rings. Right. That's right. It was the ring ceremony. Mm -hmm. And I remember talking to one of the coaches, and now I'm not a football expert, but yeah. I said, well, this guy seems to know what he's talking about. Yeah. Uh, I would hope so if he was one of our coaches. I believe he was one of the, I believe <laughs> he was one of the coaches. But uh, how did that go for you when you first started out? Because 
you're on the offensive line, that's, that's leverage, that's positioning, that's foot positioning, that's hands. Mm -hmm. how, did, uh, how did it go learning that technique? Uh, it was an experience. I was not good. There, there's no, I had a lot of enthusiasm, but I had no idea what I was doing. I definitely, the, the beauty of the offensive line, for those that don't know, is it really is a matter of who's beside you. So I currently play right tackle. When I joined, I was guard. So I was positioned between the center. Uh, there's two guards and then two tackles. So you got better. They moved you out. I played left tackle and then I got moved to right tackle. Yeah. So I, I and it makes sense with my height and wingspan for me to be outside as opposed to inside at a polling guard position. But the, the beauty of that position is I was able to form a camaraderie and a, a network with the other offensive linemen and really... Line who? Linemen. So this is, this is my favorite I, thing I, in the entire it, world. I don't care. <laughs> I, okay. I can't tell you. Like, just come watch us play. I, yeah. I, I know some people might take it uh, offensively or they want to say line women or they want to say line position or offensive line. I really don't care. I just want to play football. Uh, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't lose sleep over if you call me a lineman or a line woman. I just couldn't resist that. Yes. Uh. So I, I was just <laughs> standing there just getting low and just all I knew was, okay, this person's going to rush at me. I have the greatest quarterback in women's football behind me. Don't let them hit her. Like that was all I needed to worry about. I didn't need to worry about routes. I didn't need to worry about you know, anything other than that person's going to rush at me and they are not going to get around me. And so obviously I've progressed. I, I'd like to think I've gotten better. I believe I've gotten better. Um, so it's, it's definitely uh, a you... more nuanced position than it was when I first started. But again, when I first started, it was just, I'm going to stand here, I'm going to get low, and I'm just going to keep someone from hitting my Well, if you hadn't gotten better, you still wouldn't be doing it. They right. would have gotten somebody else. Right. As you do it... Uh, yeah. So you enjoy hitting people. I enjoy hitting people. I really, so my favorite, and I love to talk specifics because I absolutely love when someone wants to talk football with me and they want to mansplain football to me because that's what men always do. But wow. I, I love hitting people. I love hitting people in screen plays. So being able to run out, get an open field, and just lay a massive hit on someone. That's my favorite. Like, there's nothing greater than that. An open field, a very tiny cornerback or a defensive end, thinking they have a clear shot at the wide receiver or the running back and the quarterback and just coming out of nowhere and destroying them. But so, there's nothing greater than so that. you like putting on the pain. Yeah. Movement. Oh, yeah. Motion. Yeah. Momentum. Yeah. Contact. Yeah. Grunt. Yes. And then a roar. And a roar. Right. And a roar. Yeah. Nice. I, I, I'm fine when my, it's so funny. So I play in the Women's Football Alliance and they've actually removed cut blocking. We play NCAA rules and you can legally cut block in the NCAA, uh, which is essentially going for the rushers' knees, cutting them down at the line of scrimmage. They have removed that for the 2021 season and um, I'm so glad. I, I miss it. I'm going to miss it. But as someone who's very tall, I'm not very good at it. Right. So I'm actually looking forward to maybe we do some more screen plays. Maybe we get a chance to, to run out an open field. I, I, I wish we had kept it, but I my body is definitely happy that I'm not going to have to cut block I anyone. see a lot of penalty flags in the 2021 season coming at people. Over yeah, there. right? Well, we'll we it, play. We're good. We, but, we well, others will have to adjust. you got to adjust, though. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. It's just it's a it's an arsenal in in your toolbox and definitely or a, a weapon in your arsenal i should say but it's i love it i absolutely there's there's nothing better than football because i was a collegiate basketball player i played two years at a division three level and basketball was great i really enjoyed it but football like it's a sport for everyone again at six feet 200 pounds <laughs> uh there's a spot for me on the field there's a spot for my 4'11 running back. There's a spot for my 5'5 five five quarterback. Uh, there's a spot for really anyone, any body type, um, any physical makeup. Uh, and that's what I love. I watched a video not that too long ago of your 4'11 running back running behind you. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was quite the juxtaposition, yeah. but it reminded me of uh, the 1974 75 Patriots. Uh, guy a little bit before my time. Yeah, but it was a guy <laughs> in a Patriots by the name of Minnie Mac Heron. Okay. He was five foot three or five foot four. Okay. But he weighed about he weighed over two hundred pounds, okay. and uh, he would run behind John Hanna, yeah, two hundred and seventy pounds, Leon Gray, two hundred and eighty pounds, and they, Hanna was the guard, 
uh, Gray was to tackle, but they would both pull. Yeah. And go out there, and it's Heron so would put his hand on Hannah's hip. Yeah. And be right there, so the defensive players couldn't even see him. So that's what definitely what happens with us. And Ruth Mata is the running back I'm talking about. She tripped me in the Super Bowl in 2019, and it's uh, it's just so cringe. So they they play our Super Bowl on ESPN three, and. You know, they're talking about, oh, there's Aaron Truex with the pole. And then you just see me face plant it because she's <laughs> running so much faster than me. I get tripped up with her behind me. But she's fast. She's good. But I think a, a big part of our game is the fact that our left tackle, Hillary Cro Crook, is six feet tall. I'm, you know, six one, And she's 4'11". So good luck finding her when, it, when she's running behind us. So you have people of all sizes, which you mm -hmm. said. That's definitely football. You see that in football. Yeah. A few other sports, but, but football for sure. Like I said, Mac Heron was... Shorter yeah. than I am. Yeah. Uh, look at like Vince Wilfork. You know, people, no one would necessarily look at him and think, oh, that's an athlete if you just saw him on the street. But he's, he, he could was run massive. fast. He could yeah. run fast. Mm -hmm. He had good hands. Yeah. I don't know if you ever saw the video of him catching a punt in each hand yeah. from Belichick so they could take the rest of the day off. Yep. Uh, of course, he's retired now, but yeah, Vince yeah. Wilfork, yeah. he was, they always listed him at like 330 or 340, but mm -hmm. he probably went more like 370, 375. Yeah through most of his career. Hopefully he's trimmed down now so he can live a, yeah. a long, healthy life afterwards. Yeah. Uh, how many How many six-footers are there on that team? I think it's just myself and Hillary. I, I'm the tallest on the team, and then Hillary is also six feet. We have a few that are hovering around 5'10", 5 5'11". 5 yeah, yeah. um, but I'm by no means the biggest in the, in the league. So we went up against a team. I think the defensive end I was playing against was 6'8". Six, 6'8"? Eight. Six, eight? Defensive end. Six eight, wow. north of three hundred pounds. Could she move? Um, she could move me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's, she was good. She can move. Um, but I mean, when you're that big, and you, if you get leverage, I mean, yeah. do you do you need a move, or do you just need to move who's in front of you? Well, it's nice to have move to supplement that. But yeah, but, absolutely. Yeah, so, yeah. how many players are on are on a team? Uh, around 50 to 60. It, it varies every year, but we were able to carry a pretty large roster. So there's three divisions. Division three is considered a developmental league. You can only have, I believe, 35. And so smaller, smaller teams, smaller market. Uh, division two, I think you can carry a roster of 45, and then it's unlimited at D1. But typically, I mean, there's only so many numbers you can hand out, but it's typically around 50 to 60. So your, your, your season usually goes about five months Six yep, months. so typically starts in April, and the Super Bowl is usually in July. How many practices do you have during a week? Practice twice a week, so a lot. we all have to have full-time jobs. Obviously, right. we need yeah. health insurance, uh, need to be able to make ends meet in order to, to continue to play. So we practice twice a week as a team. We usually have film once a week, and then there's either a captain's practice or a game, depending on if we're in season or not. So we're looking at practices on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Film breakdown usually happens on Wednesdays and then a captain's practice on Saturday. If we're in season, then we supplement that or substitute it with a game. And you play out of a home field in Revere. We do. During the regular season, how far do you travel to play other teams? We, oh, I was so excited for the 2020 season because we were going to face some new teams that had been moved up to Division One. But we always go down to D.C., our Super Bowl is in Denver, Colorado. It has been for the last two years. Uh, but we go, we were going to go to St. Louis, Detroit, and maybe Pittsburgh this past year. Last year, when we had a season, we went to Tampa. That was a team that was moving up uh, to the higher division. And so we go all over the place. There's teams, we, we face the Cali War, who are out in California in the Los Angeles area in the Super Bowl. Um, we faced them the last two years in the Super Bowl, but we, we go all over the place. So this isn't just a small regional operation. This is a national... It's a national... There there used to be a team even in Montreal. Now it's exclusively United States, but across so the country. You said a league itself is working on being a nonprofit, or is the league already the a The league is a nonprofit. My team, the Boston Renegades, are working at being a 501c3, uh, so we can obviously do some more fundraising, uh, build up the the legitimacy of our team just from a business professional perspective and then really want to start operating uh, to just get more young girls involved, get them excited about the, the world of football and athletic engagement. And so that's really going to be a big emphasis for 2021. You need to get into the schools. Yeah. That's, yeah, I mean, and I'm sure there's many that would be interested. Absolutely. So it, it 
it's not cheap equipping a football team, even with used equipment. No. Do you guys have a bus or? Uh, we fly. We fly. We fly. So that's not cheap. Mm -mm. Uh, what's it cost? You have any? You're not in that that part of this operation. No, 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 no. So as a team, we have player dues. So essentially the player dues are required. It also helps to get some buy-in so someone's not just showing up and thinking, I'm going to just walk onto a team and hang out, you know, cover some expenses. So our player dues are minimal as it relates to the overall expenses of the team. Uh, we're really fortunate to have sponsors uh, that range from, you know, 500 to $5,000 at a local level. Uh, we have some really great partnerships that we've built up with Secret Deodorant, uh, Zenith, which is a, a football company that, pro that provides helmets. And so it, it's not cheap by any means. Uh, we do fly for the majority of our games. It's an eight game season. So you're looking at four away games, four, four home games, and then a whole playoff run. You got to stay in a hotel. Stay in a hotel, traditionally stay in a hotel two nights because we're traveling really far. So got to get in Friday, leave Sunday. You're not flying in you know, Are you Saturday. guys feeding yourselves on these trips or does that does that come into the package uh we feed ourselves i'm an offensive lineman <laughs> line woman i gotta gotta feed myself i mean we the hotels always have continental breakfast and things like yeah. that the team does a really good job taking care of us and uh we we definitely connect with people to sponsor our team and we have our player dues we try to sell tickets but once we're in season our our ownership and management are really good about Put your heads down. Focus on football. Don't worry about the logistics or the finances. Just you play football, and, and we'll worry about everything else. Now, an idea, which I'm sure uh, it, this has probably been discussed by somebody along the line. Mm -hmm. Your home games are in Revere, which is great. Mm -hmm. But there's, uh, there's, there's nice high school stadiums, even here in Salem. Uh, mm -hmm. Any thought ever been given to moving the practices out of Revere? Maybe moving mm -hmm. one game a year out of Revere to expand mm -hmm. the brand? I I like to joke that we are the Salem Renegades because if you come to any of our games, there is a very there's a large section of Salem residents and and those in my network that have have kind of latched on the onto the team and supported us. So I've talked to the mayor a lot. I'm like we got to relocate the Boston Renegades to to Salem, Massachusetts. But uh, definitely some consideration. You know, we used to play in Dillboy. Uh, Revere is inexpensive, I think, in the grand scheme of things. We played at Dillboy in Somerville, uh, but I, I think we're, we're probably there for the long haul. What, where it really gets expensive, honestly, is in the preseason when you're talking about February and March and needing to pay for indoor right space so we usually work out at four kicks there's a few different four kicks facilities we used to be at latitude which i think is now the boston sports club but that's where it gets expensive and the the thing that people don't realize although we're a semi-professional women's league we're playing at a national level we're playing at a high level we're competing for field space so we're off, often at the mercy of okay if we want to go to that high school we're very low on the priority list because right. there might be sports teams, longer, you know, more deeply developed relationships. And it really doesn't make a lot of sense for us to move around if we haven't established that relationship because those places are going to be more inclined to take care of their own uh, practices and their own sports teams as opposed to ours. Yeah, and I think in Salem, <sighs> Bertram Field's an interesting situation in Salem mm -hmm. because it's a high school football field. Yeah. But um, it's under the control, the auspices, a lot of, uh, to, of the park service. Okay. Uh, the park department somehow, too, I think. Yeah. So you'd have to navigate two different channels, I think, of Salem to, to play at Puerto Field. But it's a nice I'd field. love it. It's I'd a nice love field. It. I, 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 I wish it was still real grass. Yeah. But, you know, that's just... We, city government doesn't maintain anything if they don't have to. And grass is difficult to maintain. It's expensive to maintain. So they went with that with the synthetic. It, it's, it's a nice surface. Oh, as a football player, I love turf. And it's I got a full track to. too that they can make you run a couple of times when you do no, something I'm, wrong. No, I'm good. You're good with I'm that. I'm good. The, the I'm I'm not a big runner. I'm I'm a big slow jogger. I've seen you out there slow jogging. Slow jogging, okay. always. See, yeah. I'm jealous that you can even slow jog because I can't do that anymore. Well, you were doing workouts on the common when we. I still am. You are okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm How's that going? It. I've been doing um, pretty steady. I started in March, as soon as the lockdown hit. Uh, 25 minutes of calisthenics to include push-ups, planks, a okay. little bit of this, a little bit of that. Uh, I did that very religiously into July and August, and I kind of eased up a little bit. Yeah. And then I started picking it up again around Halloween, and uh, right now I'm uh, doing this American Cancer Society fundraiser. Oh, right. And uh, I'm up to, you're supposed to do 25 push-ups a day for that. Okay. So this is the 13th, so I've got 13 days in a row of push-ups. 
and I did a hundred this morning, so I'm at sixteen hundred. I set a goal of three thousand, so I'm ahead of that. I'm, I keep on thinking I'm going to do a set of push-ups this morning, and some part of my body, like my shoulders, is going to say, "Okay, <laughs> slow down." <laughs> yeah, and uh, so I'm being very careful, but I, I haven't I haven't hit that point. I can't uh. think of the day, but uh, I've, the last time I did push-ups 13 days at all, but I'm doing planks, I'm doing squats, I'm doing some standing lunges, and I'm doing hip raises okay. and dips, and I do the dips, I do push-ups at home, then I, when I leave to walk downtown, I do push-ups on the wall at Collins Cove. I okay, think the, yeah. I think the neighborhood has decided I'm out of my mind. <laughs> People will drive by and toot, and if they say, hey, Bill, it's somebody I know, if they mm -hmm. don't say call my name, they think they're just tooting to a crazy guy. Yeah. And then I go to the common and I do push-ups and dips on the benches. Okay. And I do squats and hip raises there. So, and I would say I went from a 36 waist in March to a 35 waist in October. Okay. And I bought these pants a couple of months ago, 35, and I bought a pair of 34. Look at you. I can't fit into them yet. <laughs> you're going to get there. So if, you, <laughs> if you're looking at your workout, you could only do one exercise, one free weight, or not even free weight, one exercise. Period. Period. That's it. it. If, I w if my body would let me. If your body would let you, you can only do I'd one. I'd be running. Running. I'd run. It's the only exercise for me where my brain turns off. Really? My brain doesn't turn off. I'm one of those guys. I can sleep, though, but it doesn't turn off. It just does not turn off. Okay. Uh, the only thing I've ever been able to do in my life is go on a long, slow, well, slow, that's relative to whoever else is running, Yeah. a long run. <laughs> my brain turns off. I'm, I'm aware of my surroundings. I'm aware of what I'm doing, but that's all I'm thinking about. Did you run marathons? I did one in my life. It was a long time ago. Which uh, one? Uh, the DC Marathon in 1986. Oh, okay. Uh, I did it as part of an army group. Oh, uh, we came over from Europe to do it. I was in Europe. Really? But um, I've, I've, I, over the years, I ran just about every distance as far as road races. Yeah. I didn't stop running road races until uh, 2009. I ran the 5K at the golf course, which they okay. don't have anymore. And I ran the turkey, the, the turkey Thanksgiving trot. race, the five miler. And uh, I could barely run, but I ran it. Mm -hmm. And even with arthritis on both knees, I, I did uh, a 30 minutes at, at the 5K. Mm -hmm. And then on the, uh, That's on, the good. on the five mile of I did fifty minutes, mm -hmm. but I couldn't really stride most of the time. I kind of shuffled, and uh, it, that was the race where I was as I was passing, crossing Webb Street down Memorial from Memorial Drive, as I was shuffling and I was struggling, mm -hmm. and I heard somebody say, "Gee, I remember him when he could run." <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if people say that. So that's that's why I worry about when yeah. I'm running. If someone's uh, running, like if someone's driving by or running by, they're like, "Isn't that a female athlete? Isn't uh, that a professional uh, athlete? Doesn't she play for a it's, it's, national football team? Why is she running so slow? Well, I, why I is she drinking a beer as she's uh, running?" Th see, that's a good idea. <laughs> I don't really care what people think overall, but that was telling because I was thinking the same thing at the time. Yeah. Because I literally, I could only stride. I would say <coughs> for. 80 to 100 yards at a time. Mm -hmm. And then I had to go back to that shuffle. I managed to stride. I started striding at Union Street and went around the corner and finished in front of the Boys and Girls Club at the time. And that was about the maximum that I could actually do anything resembling a full stride. Other than that, I was just shuffling my feet. And yeah. uh, that's not running. But I can still power walk. Power and walk, And yeah. I'm thinking about doing that when the warm weather gets here. Yeah. Uh, then I'll definitely get down out to that, to that 34 waist if, I, if I'm not there yet. Got it. But I did. I deliberately bought a pair of pants a size too small. Mo motivation. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, I, I, yeah. It's just because I see it and I, those pants are laid out where I see them every day. Yeah. Uh, so I'll probably start power walking. And hmm. uh, I started power walking after that two, those 2009 races on the treadmills at mm. the Y. I was working at the Y at the time. And although I couldn't quite get my brain turned off like I can running, yeah. It was a reasonable facsimile, yeah. close enough. Mm -hmm. So what's your exercise? I love jump squats. Like if I can't go into a gym, uh, I, I've gone back to the Salem Y. I'm really happy with what they've done in terms of keeping things clean and right. the protocols as it relates to COVID. But if I cannot go into a gym, if I can do jump squats, air squats, but something that includes some kind of upward mobility trajectory, I just, I love it.
I, I, I always love stuff like that. It's, it's why I like kettlebells. Love yeah. kettlebells. Yeah. My favorite, if I have to choose weights, I'm always choosing kettlebells. Deadlifts are great, but kettlebells for sure. Kettlebells and dumbbells. Yeah. The big bars, I don't mess with them too much. I used to. I, yeah. I stopped bench pressing, um, well, geez, a long time ago, and I, d I just started to do uh, pressing with dumbbells and with yeah. kettlebells. Uh, bench pressing and, you know, trying to push more weight, and I got to a point where my shoulders were saying, Hey, <laughs> yeah, don't do this, and and I stopped doing it, and the the, the shoulders were, and uh, I started doing using dumbbells more, but yeah, but yeah. that's why I like kettlebells. You can incorporate a lot of movement with kettlebells. Really great, even with dumbbells too. But uh, yeah, and there's something so fun about the movement of that too, and just needing to be able to control it. And I I begrudgingly run, but I've started to try to incorporate either stairs or hills. So at least if I'm running slow, it's because I'm running a pill. It's not because I'm out of shape. It's just because I'm running. <laughs> Well, Salem is deceptive if you're running in Salem. Mm -hmm. You are going uphill a lot of times, and you yeah. may not Over by Dead Horse it. Beach, that'll sure. get you. Well, you, you, run from, uh, you run up Derby Street. When you get to Fort Ave, yeah. you're going uphill from actually starting about Carlton Street. It's very, very gradual. Then oh, it gets yeah. steeper going up Fort Ave. But you're basically going uphill at a gradually increasing incline for about a half a mile. Yeah. And you may not even know it for the first quarter of a mile. Yeah. And then, so, th there's... The hills are deceptive in Salem. Yeah, that's what they always say about the Boston Marathon too, because you're it's deceptive because you're running downhill. You don't realize it, right? But at the, when you start the Boston Marathon, you're actually running downhill, and also because of the point in the race that you hit Heartbreak Hill, it's and unbelievable. But people also get there like I'm making great time. It's wonderful. And Heartbreak well, is more of a long hill, yeah. than a steep hill. Yep. But those are worse yeah. because usually when you hit those long gradual slopes, you're about halfway through them before you realize it, and then yeah. you haven't adjusted to it. Yeah. Uh, some people are good at running, doing uphills. Some people aren't. Some people are good at downhills. Uh, yeah. Some aren't. Uh, Heartbreak Hill is a is a tricky one. Yeah. So, any marathons in your future? No. Why? No, no. I I don't think that I could. It's not even the running component. I just don't want to do anything for five hours. I really don't. It's I have a hard time even sitting down and watching a movie. I just have zero zero patience zero focus when it comes to just putting my mind to something which i know sounds bizarre but i'm really i think that's why i love football because you work in these spurts of okay it's you know first and ten you know you have four downs whatever it might be and it's really quick but i have a really hard time committing to anything for that long i just i get bored it is a long time I, it's a very long fortunately time. for me when, in my running days I, I didn't have to focus that long but we did do um I had a marathoner in here two weeks ago. Do, have you met Jordan Kinley? I don't think I have. He's part of the Notch Running Group. Okay. He's a low 220s marathoner. Oh, wow. He's, I'm pretty sure he's the fastest marathoner ever in Salem. And I'm giving him, I, I, it kind of <coughs> hurts me to say that because guess where he's from? California. Perfect. Yeah. I, as I most people, as most wonderful people are. Yeah, I'm a little California heavy in this series so far. I'm going to uh -oh. have to work on that. Yeah. Uh, but um, it's... I lost my train of thought. Where was I? You were saying that Jordan is part of the Notches oh, yeah, um, Leaders part, yeah. for Leaders. He's running in the low 220s. Well, yeah. So, but but anyway, he was here. It's, it, but oh, he, yeah. he, he was uh, he was here. We talked to him. So he's another Notch regular too. I'm probably running a little heavy on Notch regulars too. I, uh, I'm a I'm a Notch drinker. I'm not a Notch runner. I I, I don't, don't, I've I don't participate I don't think in that. I don't know if you've I've ever seen you with, with the running group. I'm not usually awake before noon on a Sunday. I got to be completely honest. So you like your beer. I like my beer. I also like my sleep. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I enjoy Notch beer, definitely. Uh, I haven't really been back. Obviously, the the shutdown has kind of made things strange, but definitely enjoy going there. And obviously, making cocktails at Deacon Giles. I'm, I'm a gin and tonic person, probably first and foremost. That's where we were going next. You saw it coming. I did. I did. We're on the same wavelength. Uh, there you go. So We're, I'm feeling it. Yes. So how long <laughs> have you been uh, slinging cocktails at Deacon Giles? Uh, probably four years now. Just almost four years, about a year after I moved here. Was it actually? No, probably even sooner. Maybe within six months of me living here, I was going to Deacon. <laughs> I probably shouldn't admit this. I was going to Deacon Giles a lot, hanging out by myself. And I think at some point, Jesse, one of the owners, looked at me and said, well, yeah, Okay, if we just make, teach you how to make cocktails, will you just come and work here instead of come and drink here all the time? That's the best way to do it. That's the best so way to do it. So I, yeah. I joined there and. Uh, yeah, it's great. I really love it. Rob Hennigan is the, the bar manager there and has just 
elevated the cocktail program. It's just unbelievable. I mean, he's just, every time I go in there, I'm like, we're putting how many ingredients in this cocktail? We're doing what? We're hydrofuging what? I have no yeah, idea. But all that, all it's that stuff. best cocktail program in town. I know I'm biased, but he's just been able to elevate it so much. They're and very creative. locally made. Yeah. Really love it. it. Uh, the, the world of cocktails is amazing. I mean, I've, I've, I've slung a few drinks in my day. Uh, I haven't done any active bartending in, in seven years, six, seven years. Um, it's changed so much. Mm -hmm. uh, the craft cocktail thing was just starting yeah. 10 years ago, and most of your local bartenders were kind of poo-pooing it. And then yeah. a couple of them got into that. Yeah. And uh, I mean, the fanciest drinks that we made when I was, you know, for most of my bartending days were, were some of your layered rum drinks and stuff like that. Yeah. And now it's gone gone up way beyond that my favorite is we we got a negative review as you always do in october but someone gave a negative review and said i can't really take taste the alcohol it's such a great tasting drink and i'm not assaulted by the taste of alcohol <laughs> well if you want to taste the alcohol drink it, just, drink just it drink it straight, drink it straight <laughs> like, don't don't order an egg white cocktail with seven ingredients and then be surprised that it doesn't just taste like rum yeah so people are finicky people are weird but yeah it's definitely even again from the time i started at deacon to now uh, it's definitely increased but I, I see it at other other restaurants as well a lot of really great cocktail programs are popping up well ledger has a great cocktail program Ledger's opus great. has a great cocktail program and just about all of them uh, have one or two bartenders that they let spread their wings yeah absolutely uh, some of the some of the bars don't do that. Yeah. It's like, in for me, I think every bartender, every good bartender, has a couple of signature cocktails that have nothing to do with the business that business's yeah. craft cocktail, uh, Bloody Marys, Cosmopolitans, yeah. something that that that's your drink. People mm -hmm. come to see you because you make this drink. Yeah. And if you go from one place to another and they tell you, well, you can't make your Cosmopolitan anymore. It's like a hairdresser. You're not going to bring your crowd. Yeah. They're going to come in for that Cosmo. Yeah. Do you have a signature cocktail? Every single cocktail. So I, I like spice, spicy. I, I'm not a sweet cocktail drinker. That shocks me. Yeah. I, Nothing uh, sweet about me. It's <laughs> shocking. Uh, I love spice, just assaulting hot sauce flavors. So my signature is always going to be a spicy cocktail that's mixed with some kind of a, a fruit component. So okay. right before um, we, we shut down a little bit at the beginning of 2021, but we had added a drink to the menu that was chili infused vodka and nice. then some agave, some strawberry puree, some pineapple, and just really wanted to make a nice cocktail that had that heat but then was balanced out really nicely with with some kind of a fruit or citrus the so infusion is fun really uh, fun and you never used to see that now everybody's yes. doing it everyone's uh, doing it yeah i did it for a short time even though i wasn't technically bartending i was infusing uh vodkas for aurora that little the, the, the two oh, or yeah. three years they were around i was doing and and i i fiddled around a lot i did a i did uh i did a coffee bean uh French roast. Nice. Infusion. For vodka or for yeah. rum? Uh, for vodka. Okay. Uh, I did a lot of them, but I also did one with uh, gummy, gummy beers, gummy worms. I did a gummy worm. I had to filter that a lot. I did a Be gummy good. worm. People, people really, really, they, they like that. But I think infusion's fun. I do it at home sometimes. Yeah. It, uh, it's fun because you can, you can infuse a vodka, even a rum, with anything. Yeah. And just figure it out. Oreo cookies. I haven't done that yet. I'm going to do an Oreo yeah. cookie infusion. You won't be interested in that. I won't. It, it's few and far between. Don't get me wrong. I love a like, good night fatty. I will definitely have a craving to go eat a, you know, several cookies <laughs> or something like that. But when it comes to a cocktail, I want a gin and tonic. I want a spicy cocktail. I want a dirty martini. And that is it. That's just really how I operate. I'm not a, uh, I'm not a cocktail guy. I, I like my whiskey. Scotch, rye, bourbon. I like it neat. Mm. Sometimes on ice, and depending on the product, maybe a drop of water instead of that. But I'll drink an old fashioned. Yeah. But, but if it's not muddled, I don't want it. And that's a problem for me nowadays. A lot of these places don't muddle them. Uh, and uh, I'll do a, a Manhattan once in a while. But that's yeah. about it. I'm not into the. But like I went, to, I go, I'll go to Deacon Jazz once in a while and, and have one of those those fancy drinks and, yeah. and, and they're always good. But you're always going out. I, I see the photos. You are always out and well, about. Well, they're not all mine. Okay. Do you know how to tell for sure that they're my fo that, that they were my photos? Even though this isn't always true. Okay. All you gotta do is look at this table. 
if my if my hat's in the photo, okay, then I ate that. <laughs> then I ate that food and drank that drink. I'm trying to imagine if you put the hat on the camera and try to take a photo. Okay, uh, the hat is on the table, but nine. Uh, I would say eighty percent of the time. When did you, like what brought you into photography? What got you into? I that? don't consider myself a photographer. I you just guy, take photos. I'm of a food. guy that takes pictures. <laughs> I do. Uh, I I took. I was in Japan in 1979. I was in Japan for three years, starting in 1979, and I bought a Yashica 35 millimeter camera. Okay. And I started taking pictures then. Okay. And but about ten years later, I gave that camera to my brother, and I never started taking took, took a picture again until I entered the wonderful world of cell phones. And, 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 and I'm actually, I'm going to buy, it's on my list of things to do this year, I have to go out and buy myself a real camera, even though the, the cell phones can do a, a really, really good job. Yeah. So I like, I like to take perspective shots from angles. <laughs> you know, I don't like to take just a standard shot. Yeah. Like I take a picture of a burger, I don't want to take a picture of it from up here, I yeah. take it here, from down here, yeah. from over here, and turn yeah, the camera the lighting, this way. Right? Well, you're chasing the lighting, but I just yeah. like the different angles. Yeah, and uh, and uh, and I, uh, that's that's what I do with my phone all the time. Like I took pictures this morning, yeah, uh, where I'm just angling it. I'm uh, I'm 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 on my knees sometimes, and <laughs> and it's not easy for me to get down on my knees. Yeah. but, but you got to get the shot, and it's much harder to get back up. But yeah, I got to get the shot. So I I just like it. So I don't consider myself a photographer, and I think a lot of the people today, I'm sorry guys, that are out there calling themselves photographers or not. There are people that have a camera, that know how yeah. to use the camera, and they know how to use the filters and the edit programs like I do, uh, but they're not really a photographer. Yeah. Uh, it, it, and I don't mean that as a shot at anybody. I just because just you have a camera, I mean, I've sold photographs. People have bought yeah. photos for me, but a lot of, but I like, I've, I sold some photos a few years ago because I had photos of the old Ropes estate okay. in North Salem on Felt Street. Yeah. When it was all falling down. Mm -hmm. I went in there when it was all marked off and you weren't supposed to go in there. And I went in there and I spent an hour and I took like 150 pictures of the house, okay. all angles, all sides, the barn, the garage, everything. And I was the only one that had pictures like that. Yeah. I put them in the Salem patch because I was right in front of them at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, about a year later, the guy that bought the house bought pictures, That's bought great. photos. Yeah. So I've been paid and, I, and I've sold photos since then too. But... I don't consider myself a photographer. Yeah. I, I think that's being presumptive. Okay. And I'm never presumptive. Or maybe I am, but not, <laughs> not in this particular case. Well, we've only got a couple of minutes left. Okay. What have we not covered that you want to cover? What have, what have you not said that you want to say? So Any plans to run for office? <laughs> <laughs> no. I get that question every day. So. No, I... I I thought about it. So I had a very illustrious career as a student body president in college. So I've, that was my foray into politics, and that's about as far as I'm going to go. Oh. But I, I couldn't do it. I, I don't have a filter. You could. I could. I couldn't do it eloquently and succinctly. And You, you could. Okay. But before I ended up somehow on the Salem City Council, I, people would, I, I got asked a few times, and I would say, no, I couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. I'd end up jumping up out of my seat and throttling somebody. Yeah. I'd end up throwing something at somebody. I'd end up cursing somebody out in a public meeting. I didn't do that. Mm -hmm. Once I got on the other side, and I was in that chair, perspective changed. Okay. My opinions didn't change. My thought processes didn't change, but I edited myself better. Okay. Without even knowing I was doing it. I was actually mm -hmm. impressed that I was able to do that because there were a couple yeah. of times where maybe I did want to reach over and grab yeah. somebody and shake them just a little bit. Yeah. But I never did. So it can be done. So maybe when, when I find a spare moment, uh, the one thing we didn't cover that I do want to share, I recently launched a podcast. So similarly to photography, I feel like everyone thinks they are a podcaster and can podcast. I've stayed but, away from that. But I recently launched one with a, another player from the Minnesota Vixen, which is another team. And so, so football based. Another football based podcast. Yes. It's called Cleat Sheets. It comes out bi-weekly. Uh, we're going to increase to once a week once our season gets started. And it's just two women talking women's football, breaking it down. Uh, there was really no one doing that. We were really excited to go past the the novelty of women's football and really talk about pass rushing, plays, how do you prepare, you know, what are the 
the mental components, the physical components. And so we launched that in October of 2020 and it's been going well. So I would just say that if folks are interested in learning more about women's football, to definitely give us a listen. We will link that podcast along Absolutely. with everything else that you talked about. It's going to be a long list of links, guys. <laughs> You're going to have to pay attention. And I just want to make an offer right here that if you two women discussing football need a man to come on and explain anything please to you, do i'm available please do i <laughs> i would love that i do need a man to explain it to i me. played for the salem lions in the salem midget football league for three years <laughs> we never won a game so i know what i'm talking about all right so that's it this is william lego of salem digest roundtable here with Aaron truex i think that was a pretty good conversation i hope you guys enjoyed it we'll be back uh, soon with another edition Thank you very much, Salem. We're signing off.